Good morning and thank you for being here. My name is Michael Devlin. I'm the Associate Dean for Executive Education here at the Weatherhead School of Management. It's a pretty cool title, but who in the room would not want to be the car czar? <laughs> I heard that this morning. I thought, boy, that really is every, certainly every guy's ideal job, right, to be the car czar. Um, so just to sort of calibrate you, because I like to do that, uh, you're on the campus of Case Western Reserve University. Case has got eight colleges and schools. One of them is the Weatherhead School of Management. People tend to think that's it across the street. That is it. But this is also part of it. Here we do executive education. So what does that mean? Um, we, we are sort of in three different pieces of business. Number one, we um, do what we call the open enrollment program. So if you all look in your folder, Please pull this out for me. It cost me a bloody fortune to print this thing, so let me just pull it at it. I'll be just a little bit better about it. So this is the uh, about 70 programs that we offer over the course of the year um, in all sorts of, of different areas. Finance, management, leadership, innovation, you name it. Uh, we've got a class in it. So I would invite you to take a look at that. So that's sort of one of our businesses. The second business we do is that we run our executive MBA program out of here. Is Carly and Anderson the room? She's not. Um, uh, our EMBA program is one of the nation's top-ranked programs. Uh, and if you or, or uh, anyone you know is interested in an executive MBA, this is the one to take by golly. And then the third piece of business we're in that uh, people either don't know anything about or know a lot about is uh, our custom business where we work with a, a specific company on a customized program around a specific set of objectives for that organization. So it may be leadership development, it may be strategy formulation, uh, it may be organizational alignment, uh, a number of different things, but we uh, gather together uh, the best professors we've got and the best professors that other schools have got and do a customized program to help you with a specific business or organizational issue that you might have. So that's sort of where you are, and that's what I do, and that's what uh, the people who uh, are here from my uh, organization do. So that gets me to today. Um, about, I don't know, six weeks ago, uh, Peter Richkin, this little South African dude here, who is the, uh, the chair of our banking and finance department, we're talking, and, uh, and he's, he's, this is sort of classic academia, he said to me, you know, Last night I was really um, thinking about this whole economic crisis and how we got here, and so I thought, well, I'll just put together a slide that sort of portrays the flow of what happened and how we got here. And he said, you know, next thing I know, uh, the birds are singing, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, and it's 50 slides. I don't think he's going to share 50 slides today, but he's going to share uh, 100. <laughs> Right, it was five weeks ago, so it may have developed since then. So, um, so Peter sort of started to formulate this idea about how did we get here, what happened, and helping people to understand the flow, uh, and hopefully then give us some insight as to where we're going and what we're going to do to get out of this mess. Um, three or four weeks ago, we shared that just with students of the Weatherhead School and other faculty, and it was really, uh, intriguing and, and a, a sort of a gripping uh, presentation and really very enlightening, really helped us all to sort of understand how we got here. And then a couple of weeks after that, we did a follow-up panel discussion uh, with some faculty members from the finance department and the econ department to, to sort of talk about sort of next steps and next stages. So that's what we're going to do today. We decided let's do it for the public. Um, as the, the areas uh, sort of most preeminent think tank in the area of finance and e-com, we decided we ought to offer this to the public so that everyone can get an opportunity to come in and, and, uh, and, and hear this thing. Before I turn it over to them, I just want to read you a little, a uh, couple of paragraphs, I'm not going to read the whole thing, from a, a Thomas Friedman article or column that appeared in the New York Times. Uh, most of you know Tom Friedman, he wrote The World is Flat. And uh, I just got to kick out this, it sort of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about today. He said, turns out some of our country's best paid bankers were overpaid dopes who had no idea what they were selling, or greedy cynics who did not, who did know and turned a blind eye. But it wasn't only the bankers. This financial meltdown involved a broad national breakdown in personal responsibility, government regulation, and financial ethics. 
So many people were in on it. People who had no business buying a home, with nothing down and nothing to pay for two years. People who had no business pushing such mortgages, but made fortunes doing so. People who had no business building those loans into securities and selling them to third parties as if they were AAA bonds, but made fortunes doing so. People who had no business rating those bonds as AAA, but made a fortune doing so. And people who had no business buying those bonds and putting them on their balance sheet so they could earn a little better yield, but made fortunes doing so. Citicorp was, was involved in and made money from almost every link in that chain. And the bank's executives, including, sad to see, the former Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, were clueless about the reckless financial instruments they were creating, or were so ensnared by the cronyism between the bank's risk managers and risk takers that they had no interest in stopping it. These are the people whom taxpayers bailed out on Monday to the tune of what could be more than $300 billion. We probably had no choice. Just letting Citicorp melt down would have been catastrophic. But when the government throws together a bailout that could end up being hundreds of billions of dollars in 48 hours, you can bet there will be unintended consequences. Many, many, many. So with that, I turn it over to Peter Rishkin, uh, who will spend, uh, I think, about 90 minutes or so uh, taking you through sort of his analysis of this crisis. And we're going to take a little break for coffee, and there will be coffee this time. Um, for those of you who were trying to turn the urn upside down, you get the last couple of hours. Um, and then we want to come back and, and begin our panel discussion. So uh, I think you'll really enjoy what promises to be a lively discussion. And, uh, and turn it over to Peter Richkin, Chairman of the Banking and Finance Department. Well, good morning, everyone. You know, uh, I didn't know Michael was going to share that, uh, that, that note with you, but it's kind of a gloomy note. I don't think we should whip ourselves that, uh, that badly. I mean, I think, uh, you know, you can say the rating agencies have done a bad job, everyone's done a bad job, but actually, you know, over history they've actually done pretty good jobs. And so, hopefully today there'll be some good news as well as just looking at all the bad things that have, that have gone on there. So I'm chair of the uh, Banking and Finance Department. I started life off as a mathematician, and for most of the time I sit in my office and I solve stochastic differential equations, uh, which uh, surprisingly banks find unbelievably helpful for them. Or, and maybe I'm part of the problem, I don't know. Uh, but I did do a lot of work for a lot of the different investment banks. I've done consulting throughout the Pacific Rim in London, in New York, uh, working with different banks, mainly in solving uh, some derivative and risk management problems. So that's my background. Um, so what I'm going to do is walk you through uh, the, this, this, uh, the subprime crisis. <laughs> and it, it starts off with a small home that I thought I'd build up in, in, in Carolina. And, and then my in-laws said that they, they, they actually wanted to come by, so I thought I'd better set up a suite for them. My kids wanted a swimming pool. Before I knew it, I had a pond in, in the back that was a small golf course. <laughs> I think we all have aspirations. Some people call this greed. And the thing here is I managed to get really uh, a low rate uh, for this. <laughs> but whatever you do, don't panic! Whatever you do, don't panic. And of course, that's the panic cry right now of governments and central bankers uh, around the world. So how big is this uh, banking crisis? It's, it's actually uh, pretty big, and it's getting uh, uh, very much bigger uh, every day. And to put it in perspective, uh, the savings and loan crisis of, of, of 1986 in, in today's dollars would be about 200 billion. The banking crisis in Japan may have reached uh, 700 billion. Asia crisis was quite small, and right now we're sitting at 1,400 billion of, di of direct uh, bank losses and, and on financial institutions, and it's growing rapidly. So before I start out, let's just look at sort of the whole supply chain very broadly, and I'll sort of give you an outline of what, what uh, I'm going to do in the next hour or so. 
So this is a housing crisis ultimately, and it's a credit crisis. And so we want to try and relate sort of housing prices and why, the, why housing prices go down, how that actually affects Main Street. So we're going to start off with our homeowner, our mortgage broker. We'll look at the underwriting process, the whole process of securitization and leverage, the creation of credit default swaps, the marketing of, the, of, of, more, of mortgage backed securities to the public, who buys them, how Citibank and Lehman Brothers and other investment banks got involved in this product, in these products, how. Um, uh, money funds started buying up all of these securities and how ultimately that led to a credit crisis where companies like GE and Caterpillar found it very difficult to, um, to obtain funding. And then we'll look at all the participants around it. So, so my job in life, for the next hour at least, is just to sort of go through this and set the stage up. And as I do this, you know, I'm not quite sure I know the backgrounds of, of, of you all here. And so feel free to scream and shout at me. I kind of get nervous when I don't get things thrown at me. And so just sort of shout out questions or look at me in a weird way. And if you have any questions, ask my colleagues will be delighted to Well, this tragedy uh, takes place in uh, a 13-act drama, and uh, we'll go through part of the, uh, the, the supply side of it, the whole process of securitization. We'll look at sort of consumer spending and consumer debt, and we'll talk a lot about leverage, leverage in all aspects of the supply chain, consumers, firms, the role of government in creating more leverage uh, in our society, uh, we'll look carefully at that, and then we'll look at the shadow banking system. We'll look at who's buying all these products and why they're buying it and what, what the incentives were to purchase them. And we'll look at credit default swaps and synthetic uh, CDOs and other kinds of structured products. And then finally, we'll look at a few of the things of what's happened. I'm just going to pick a few of them to highlight. Uh, certain topics. And that will lead to the bailout plan, which uh, will be part of the second session. Okay? So to understand where we are and where we're going, I think it's very important to understand where we've come from. And so if you go back to the 1980s, where uh, homeowners uh, wanted to, to buy, uh, get a more mortgage, uh, it was very simple. We had, I think it was called the 3-6 three rule, where uh, savings and loan would take in deposits at 3%, they'd issue mortgages, long-dated long mortgages, 30-year mortgages at 6%, and they'd be in the golf course at 3 o'clock, <laughs> the 363 three rule. And that worked pretty well as long as the yield curve was upward sloping. And then what happened, of course, is we had um, a, a period of very high inflation where the yield curve inverted and uh, a lot of these savings and loans uh, went barely up. And so the overall conclusion coming out of the late 1970s and early 1980s was this lend long-term, borrow short-term model really doesn't work. And so the response to it was to do several things, one of which was to create Bank, uh, uh, encourage banks to make adjustable rate mortgages, float, float the interest rate so that the savings and loan wouldn't have as much interest rate risk and that would be borne by, by the homeowner. And then also regulators <coughs> encourage banks to sell fixed rate mortgages that they originated. So instead of keeping them on their books, they'd pull a lot of them and then sell them or securitize them. So I'll talk a lot about securitization, but just as an example, here we have Countrywide who would pull a whole lot of mortgages and then either could completely sell them to someone else or sell them indirectly to many, many investors all over the world. So the advantages of, of this is, first of all, by having floating interest rates, you uh, eliminate the duration mismatch. And second, by selling all these mortgages, this mortgage risk would be shared by many, many more people, many investors outside the banking system. And so that would reduce uh, risk overall by spreading it out. 
And so this model was called the originate and distribute model. And um, it was very successful. But there's two main advantage, disadvantages with it. The first one is called adverse selection. So obviously banks have an incentive to keep their best loans and sell their worst loans. So that problem is called adverse selection. And the second problem is moral hazard, where Countrywide and other banks don't have as much incentive to do screening and make sure that they're taking on good mortgages. So just to talk a little bit more about the securitization process, Imagine, here we have Countrywide that has, say, a billion dollars of mortgages. And they create a special purpose entity. And that special purpose, that trust, basically has as its assets these one billion dollars worth of mortgages. Uh, the trustee will pay a servicing fee to a lender or the servicer who is responsible for collecting the principal and interest on these mortgages. To fund this $1 billion mortgages, the uh, trust actually issues different types of securities. Uh, the simplest would be uh, just some cash flows, uh, pass-through securities. So all the principal and interest, the assets here, would just pass through to these securities. But you could have many different types of structures, and we may talk about a few of them in a while. So here you've got $1 billion mortgages, you may want to have 850 million in these blue securities, 100 million in these red securities, and 50 in these unrated securities. And you'd like these securities to be very, very highly rated. So what the trust do would do is pay a, a fee to a rating agency. And the rating agency would come along and say, yeah, we think we can rate this triple A as long as you have it credit enhanced. And so what we need to do is ensure against the event that any one of these homes default. And so you need to go to a monoline insurance company, a company like an AMBAC. And AMBAC would actually provide that credit enhancement. They'd actually guarantee payments if any of these uh, defaults occur. Okay, so now you have all of these securities which are marketed to individual investors, pension funds, and the like. And these securities are called mortgage-backed securities because they're really backed by the assets which consist of the cash flows from these mortgages. So Countrywide could do this on their own. They could actually set up a trust to do this. That's one thing they could do, in which case they'd be called a private label. But what the government did, this was a very major step, was they set up a mission. They, they created Fannie and Freddie Mae, Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and their mission was to improve home ownership of low and middle class families and to create liquid, standardized, mortgage-backed securities. Those are their two missions. And so they created Fannie and Freddie, and these agencies actually guaranteed the interest and principal would be paid, whether or not the original borrower paid. So they took out the credit risk. They did exactly what AMBAC and these minor lines were, were doing. So by purchasing the mortgages from, say, a countrywide, they allowed countrywide to go back to the market and create more mortgages for more homeowners, bringing more people into the market. Okay? Any, any questions? I have a quick question. How much visibility did the rating agencies have to those original mortgages when they come in and and, uh, and rate them. So there's several steps between Moody's and the original homeowner. How much visibility did they have? Yeah, they don't have any visibility over here. Yeah, they get involved in rating these mortgage-backed securities. So this is where they come in and they look at the pool of securities, they go through the box, they do their due diligence, and they actually come up with ratings. Or they say, this is what you have to do to be AAA rated. You have to do this, 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 and this. You have to throw some mortgages out, etc. Or you only have to reduce this number 850, maybe to 750. Okay. Is, is AMBAC a subsidiary of AIG? No. It's not. Not that I'm aware. Uh, what about the credit swap? Is, is that not the credit enhancer? 
That you can think of this. Swap. Right, that's a very good question. You can think of this as a credit swap in some sense because they they're going to pay out. They're going to pay out to this trust any shortfalls that will occur given any of these defaults. So uh, when we talk about credit default swaps, one can imagine that since AMVAC is selling credit risk, that to hedge themselves, they may want to be purchasing credit risk. And they didn't do that. Maybe I'm getting a hell of a game. <coughs> but why didn't the sellers, the investment bankers, the Merrill Lynch's and the mortgage, whoever, yes. why didn't they understand what they were selling? Oh, they fully understood what they were saying. I mean, the, you know, the whole premise of this was that home prices would still continue to go up. And as home prices go up, uh, these securities were and have and historically been very, very secure products. And I'll talk a lot more about this as we go forward. Were those SPEs on balance sheet? No, these are off balance sheet. Uh, so Countrywide would set up a separate trust and they would sell this into the trust. And so this, this trust itself would be rated triple A. But, but a lot of them have backstops, I mean, way out of the money backstops, which would come back now and be problem. Correct. Correct. And again, I'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so uh, Fannie and Freddie were incredibly successful at what they were doing, and uh, they owned or guaranteed about half of the $12 trillion mortgage market. Uh, so these were, these were very good, good securities. In fact, by 2000, if you go back to 2000, the Treasury debt in the United States at that time was declining quite rapidly, and a lot of pension funds were mandated to hold, to hold Treasury bonds. And if there were not going to be any treasury bonds, then there'd have to be something else, perhaps a little bit more risky, that uh, would be put into these pension funds. Plans. And so um, there was a need for new safe, bar, uh, new safe benchmark securities. And uh, the agencies came in and they started imitating the size and regularity of treasury or, uh, uh, auctions. And these mortgage-backed securities were just 50 basis points about over Treasury. They are viewed as very, very safe securities. So safe that Alan Greenspan indicated that the private sector capital markets would probably create benchmarks to replace Treasuries, and basically he thought these would take uh, would come from the GSEs, these uh, Fannie and Freddie. <coughs> Now, mortgage-backed security issuance has uh, really expanded. Uh, here in, 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 in sort of gray, I guess this is gray, uh, is the uh, what's called the prime mortgage-backed securities. This axis here is in trillions of dollars. So we see in 2003 alone, there was over $2 trillion of mortgage-backed securities created of a prime type. And you see the subprime, which is the top component here, it's a very small market, probably $300 billion market dollars. I mean, that's nothing in the scheme of things. So when we talk about a subprime crisis, in some sense, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. It's, it really is a, a smaller market. Now, there are some side effects to securitization that's very important uh, as we look forward to where we are now, and that comes in the form of foreclosures. Foreclosures are very expensive. They cost the average foreclosure is about $60,000. It's about 20 to 30% of the outstanding mortgage. So you want to really minimize the amount of foreclosures. And if you're dealing, if Countrywide holds something on their books and there's a problem mortgage, then it's possible to renegotiate those terms. But what we have now is you have investors over here. You have the homeowners way out over here. They, collected, pooled by, by countrywide, they sold off to Fannie Mae, and they sold as mortgage-backed securities. So while there are some uh, contracting arrangements which make sure that cash flows go through, the bottom line is that it's very difficult to do a loan modification. Once something is securitized, to do a loan modification is, is very, very difficult. I'll skip through that. 
the details of that. Now, of course, uh, uh, Fanny and Freddie did have competition. Uh, uh, Countrywide, for example, were, were setting up their private labels. And uh, back in 2005, uh, this is testimony uh, by Dan Hutt before the United States House Committee on Fe uh, Financial Services. And he quotes, one of the things we don't feel good about right now is we look into the marketplace. This is a quote actually from 2005. One of the things we don't feel good about right now is more home buyers being put into programs that have more risk. These products are far more are for more sophisticated buyers. Does it make sense for borrowers to take on risk they may not be aware of? Are we setting them up for failure? And these complexities come about because there were teaser rates, interest only, negative or amortization payment options, and low documentation requirements. So all of this made it easier for people to get into a home who shouldn't have been into in a home. And Fanny and Freddie were a little concerned about this. Of course, competitive forces ended up pushing them into this very market themselves. Competitive forces or a kick by Congress? I'll let you make that assessment, perhaps a little bit of both. But they did get into that market. Should they have gone into that market, obviously, Standing where we are today, looking back, probably not. So the summary for, for, for Act 1 is that, you know, government definitely encourages home ownership. We give tax deductions on mortgage interest payments. This in itself encourages leverage. Uh, they created government-sponsored agencies to promote home ownership, they, which essentially is encouraging people to take on homes which perhaps they may not otherwise be able to get into. So as long as we have rising home prices, this is a good, this is not a bad thing. But accompanied with that, we had uh, an adjustable rate mortgages where we put a lot of uh, interest rate risk back on the homeowners. We expanded subprime lending, and that led to a lot of uh, people being in houses who probably shouldn't have. So that's Act 1. Act 2 is just the American consumer, the un, just the appetite for spending consumer spending. So here's the behavior of stock prices up until about 2006, and here's home prices. And as, and as long as home prices are skyrocketing, uh, you know, pretty much everything is good. But of course that didn't last, and depending on which market you're in, home prices have come tumbling down in, to different degrees in different regions of the country. So here, I'm looking at San Diego, which is a, a market that I'm, that I'm following. Now, if you look at the ratio of household debt to gross disposable income, you see France is down over here. It's been growing over time around 60%. And you look at households in the United States, and they close to 140%. There's only one other country worse than the United States and that's uh, Britain. And now you look at what's happened to delinquencies in the mortgage market. You go back, if you look at the cohort coming out of 2003, this is the uh, delinquencies on subprime. You can see the cohort coming out of 2003 after about uh, 60 months, uh, that's five years later, 15% uh, of, um, of mortgages were delinquent. If you look at the cohort of 2004, it was a lot worse. The cohort of 2005 was a lot worse. The cohort of 2006 was a lot worse. The cohort of 2006, after two years, 35% were delinquent. And then you look at 2007, you think by, by now people would say, well, this is not a good thing to be doing. 2007, that got off to a horrendous stop. A year, by the beginning of 2008, almost 15% of them were in default or delinquent. <coughs> and even in Alt A, that Alt A is somewhere between subprime and prime, uh, the market was well, the same pattern exists 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007. 
very slow recognition by the people issuing the stamp. And even in the prime market, I mean, the prime market, obviously, this vertical axis is a lot lower. But you can see, <coughs> so the 2007 cohort, you know, this is prime, uh, you know, after, after a year, something like 1.5% were, were, were having problems. And of course, the market for mortgage-backed securities punished these things, and the prices of various uh, mortgage-backed securities, depending on their credit ratings, uh, started to decline dramatically, reflecting the recognition that there was a problem in the housing market. So when you've got very highly leveraged consumers that are really dependent on home prices going up, uh, that's uh, a problem. And uh, as soon as prices fell, of course, the response was to create tighter lending standards, uh, yet falling home prices, sluggish growth. <coughs> so the charge-off rates and residential mortgages are now expected to, pe to peak by about 2% by 2000, middle of 2009. So we're still not out of the woods on this one. And then the pressure on household balance sheet causes a deterioration in consumer loans. Uh, consumers move from home equity loans, they move to unsecured credit card debt. So now they're using their credit cards. And uh, in this country, I don't know, what's the population of this country? 300 million? How many credit cards do you think were issued? This, well, not credit cards issued, but advertisements made for credit cards. Credit card applications sent out to homeowners. How many do you think were made in this country this last year? Hmm? Three billion. Three billion. I mean, that's 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 a lot. And so, uh, you know, the the credit card market, credit card secur securitization has been somewhat stable, but one cannot sort of count on this lasting too long. And then, of course, weaker consumers, they don't go to shopping malls, uh, they don't buy condominiums, uh, the, 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 the whole um, commercial real estate market has started to see the effects of this. And in fact, we saw this really just um, the week before City ran into big problems. The reason City ran into big problems was because this, of the massive holdings in commercial real estate. And that just plummeted in the last, in the few weeks just before Thanksgiving. Okay, so, so the first chapter we saw that uh, the, process, the problems with securitization or some of the issues with securitization. The second act, we see that homeowners are up to hearing duty. And now we go and look at firms. And here the government, of course, gets involved again. And they say, you know, we'll, we'll make it advantageous to issue debt. So when you look at the firm's optimal capital structure, the whole idea is to have just enough debt. Just keep pushing the debt and trading it off against the cost of bankruptcy. But you want more and more debt. Can we go a little bit more? Can we use this tax shield more and more? So there's a big tax advantage to debt. And so we've seen leverage of firms rise dramatically. And that's been accompanied. It's a conscious decision of firms to do this. So that's resulted in the declining ratings of firms overall in the United States. In fact, you know what these six companies have in common? They're the only six companies in the United States of America that are triple A rated. This is it. Now at the same time, the Federal Reserve policy maintained essentially negative real interest rates, uh, fueling a, 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 a cheap credit boom. And so I have a, a paper which I'll be delighted to send to you if you request it. Uh, it's a paper that I've worked on with Joe Halbrick at the Federal Reserve Bank and George Panacci from the University of Illinois. And we use a lot of information to tease out the term structure of inflation and the term structure of real rates. But what you'll see in this, in this graph here is that from 2001 to about 2005, real rates were essentially negative, kept negative. So this encouraged uh, even more uh, um, leverage. 
And then the last thing we see is private equity getting involved, coming in and buying up firms and leveraging them up to the maximum. So all of this has led to a massive amount of leverage in the commercial sector. We have homeowners that are totally leveraged, we have firms that are ter terribly leveraged, and we've got, we've got a government that's borrowing heavily. And at the same time, Wall Street banks are very leveraged. And if you look at Wall Street banks, uh, here we have Morgan Stanley, that by 2007, their asset to equity ratio was 32 to 1, the highest it's ever been. We've got Fannie and Freddie, which arguably, depending on how you count it, can be as leveraged as 70 to 1. That means any bad sneeze, any bad sneeze is going to cause havoc. So we're all just hoping, we're just hoping that uh, home prices are, are, are sustained. Because ultimately, everything can be traced, traced back to those home prices. Did you said asset to equity. Did you mean debt to equity? Uh, no, this is... Uh, no, it's assets to this equity. is assets to equity. So the, equ the equity base was 3%. You know, one okay. Oh, okay, and the rest of it is debt. The rest of it, right. Okay. okay, so that's sort of the supply side of it. Now let's see, well, who would be buying these products, these mortgage-backed securities? And so we'll, we'll look at that now. So here's our mortgage-backed securities. And here's interest rates. They're going down, and in, in, riskless interest rates are really low, and everyone's looking for some form of enhancement. So we have hedge funds gobbling these things up. We have sovereign wealth funds that are looking for a place to park their money. We've got pension funds, endowment funds, looking for anything. They don't want to get 2%. They want to get anything above 2%. So they, there's just a, a huge appetite for these funds, for these products. Why? Because these products are AAA rated securities. The credit risk for a large part is being uh, guaranteed by either Fannie and Freddie, AMBAC, MBIA, and any one of these other monolines. Why didn't they look under the hood? Well, you know, when I go and buy a car, I, I always buy second-hand cars. I'm a, a fan of the Lexus. I go and buy a second-hand Lexus. And I don't even know, quite honestly, I don't even know how to open up the hood. <laughs> but what I do is I look the agent in the eye, and they say it comes with the Lexus certification. And so I buy into that certification. Okay? And so I think most of these hedge funds, these sovereign wealth funds, they saw this as rated triple A. It's backed by MBIA. These things are very solvent institutions. They're going to be able to perform. Historically, they've done a phenomenal job. They've never done a bad job. What I want to focus in on is something called the shadow banking system. And, and a good example of that is Citigroup. And so what Citigroup would do is they would create a trust. And this trust, they, uh, this would, or SIP as it's called, they would throw into it asset-backed securities. And they would fund those asset-backed se securities by short-term commercial paper or short-term debt. So for all practical purposes, these SIPs were acting as the new savings and loan. This is exactly what they were doing. They're, just, they're going back to the 1970s. They were getting long-term assets funded by short-term debt. And as long, so they're totally playing the yield curve. As long as the yield curve is upward sloping, this is going to work like a charm. And they could continue creating these mortgage-backed securities and spinning them off into these SIRTs. And Citigroup was one of the big culprits of this area. They did this, they did this over and over and over again. Well, who would they sell that commercial paper to? They would sell the commercial paper that funded these mortgage-backed securities to money funds. And so here we have our money funds that are buying up commercial paper that are really backed by mortgage-backed securities. 
And they wouldn't only buy commercial paper that were asset-backed securities, they'd buy commercial paper from the Caterpillars of the world, the Fords of the world, the General Electrics of the world in this commercial paper market. So you've got a low interest rate environment and you've got these basically governments, implicitly government-backed uh, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and, you know, when the ducks are quacking, the demand for these products is so high that when the ducks are quacking, feed them. So Citigroup had even more incentive to create these mortgage-backed securities because there was a ready market out there that would gobble them up. So just to give you a sense of the size of the markets, uh, the subprime, subprime loans, as I mentioned, it's a small market, 300 billion. Here's the size of the Alt-A loan market, prime loan market, commercial real estate. This is the one that's undergoing a lot of stress right now. Uh, consumer loans and corporate loans. About a $12 trillion market. If you assume a 5% losses, maybe that's a $600 billion write-off. Asset-backed securities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about CDOs later on. Uh, prime mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities, investment-grade corporate bonds, etc. This is about an $11 trillion market. So the size of these debt markets are not small. Any questions that I can respond to before I forge on to credit default swaps and creating more leverage, even more leverage? If you think you haven't had enough, let's talk about credit derivatives and their role. Did Fannie Mae ever do, do mortgage-backed securities on the subprime and non Yes, they did. But I think about a trillion of them. When the banks or other uh, uh, mortgage lenders sold their mortgages, I assume there was never any recourse back onto the banks for defaults. And once it's gone, it's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone. Right. Correct. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Were the uh, Morgan Stanley and Langdon uh, regulated as to how much leverage they could have ever? Yeah, I mean, all, bank, all banks are regulated, and so there would be some guidelines as to what they could do and what they, they couldn't do. Banks. No, the, yeah. the investment banks weren't regulated in terms of what the same way the commercial banks were. But they still, they couldn't take unlimited leverage, could they? They used that. The SEC used that. That, that rate um, back, on, I think, in about 2005. Yeah. So all commercial banks are regulated. The investment banks, they, they fall under the, what, the SEC jurisdiction? Yeah. Yeah. Do we have a sense as to how much was bought by overseas buyers? How much did this stupidity do we spread around the world? Oh, I think quite a lot. Um, uh, I think one of the one of the largest players that people were starting to get a little concerned about uh, were these players. I think I've referred to them over here. Yeah, these sovereign wealth funds that were starting to get really big, and mainly from China and the Middle East. I don't know how big they were. I think they were still relatively small, maybe 3%. The hedge funds were very big participants in this. But certainly a lot of it went, went overseas. Okay, so now I want to focus on one aspect that's uh, got quite a lot of press, um, and that is uh, the, the credit default swaps. And to really understand credit default swaps and the role of leverage, I just want to go back and talk about the types of mortgage-backed securities that could be issued. So here we have our trust, and the cash flows coming in consist of interest payments and principal payments. And, uh, you know, what makes mortgages a little different from bonds is that you have prepayments. People move, they get another job, they get divorced, whatever the reason is, they sell their homes, they prepay their mortgages. 
So the cash flows aren't exactly predictable. They're quite predictable, but not exactly predictable. But the credit risk is generally taken out of them because they're insured by a monoline. And so the first set of cash flows could go to the top trash. So you've got a whole lot of cash flows coming in. And think of this as a waterfall. If there's enough to pay out the claims of the first tranche, then it goes down to the second tranche. I love that word, tranche. <laughs> it's one of the few words I like to say with a really thick American accent. <laughs> tranche. <laughs> I call it a tranche. <laughs> and then you come down to the third, the third tranche. And um, the third tranche, you know, they're sort of begging for any cash flows that are left over. And of course, if there's some defaults over here or some interest isn't paid, then they don't get, they don't get any of that cash flow. So the first set of cash flows come to this tranche. If there's anything left over, it comes to this class. And anything left over comes to this. And if there's a default, the defaults, the defaults first hit this lower tranche. And then they would affect this tranche and then if it's really bad, maybe 20% default rate, you'll see cash flows affected of this tranche. So if you're an owner of this tranche, you know, there's some foreclosure nonsense going on, and you just say, you know, I'm really glad I didn't buy this tranche. They, they got what they deserve. Right? And so you're not, you're not interested in renegotiating with any homeowner in terms of the loan. You don't have those kinds of incentives. And the servicer, the servicer's role in, in, in sort of renegotiating um, terms with the homeowner, their rel their rel objectives are not well laid out. I mean, I think if you go back to the 1980s, 1990s, you know, lawyers didn't worry too much about this. I think as we go forward from where we are, you're going to see a lot more attention playing, playing on the ability to restructure mortgages even if they're in a securitized bin. I think that's, that needs a lot more attention than it, than it currently has got. So anyway, now we've got, we've got this, this waterfall cash flow. And so obviously, this is gonna be rated triple A. This is gonna be rated triple A. These junior tranches are gonna be less, they're gonna require high yield, they're gonna be more risky, and the lower tranches may be very illiquid and difficult to sell. So what we're going to do, whenever you've got something less liquid, what you do is you try and pull them together and restructure them into tranches again. And so this is exactly, this is called the CDO, the Nationalized Debt Obligation. We take the illiquid assets from many, many asset-backed security trusts we take that, we create a pool out of those, we create another trust out of that, we create a pool out of that, and we issue securities against that trust. The top tier, we hope to get rated AAA, and the bottom one is gonna be in liquid as well. Okay, and so we'll get the rating agencies involved, what do we have to do in order to get this top tranche rated AAA? Okay, any questions on this? Because this is quite, a, quite an important concept. The thing is, why stop there? Why stop there? Why don't we do it again? Yeah. How do you pull those out of the original? You just pull them. So they're illiquid securities. You go to a bunch, roughly speaking, you go to a bunch of trusts and you say, sell me your trusts, sell me your illiquid securities. We'll pull them and we'll fund them by issuing claims against them again. So it's exactly the same way. So here we have a CDO squared, which takes all the junk left over from these CDOs, which are in turn are derivative securities based on these derivative securities, which in turn are based on pools of cash flows from mortgages. You know, this was well known. This was well known even back, in, they used to do this kind of stuff. It's not as if it's a new phenomenon. They've been doing this for years and years. In fact, one of the very first supercomputers were bought by Salomon Brothers. And they bought supercomputers because they needed supercomputers to try and value these, these, these kinds of claims. This is where quantitative finance was so helpful to this process. So the demand was out there 
because the rates were, the interest rates were going to be higher, and that's what drove it, as opposed to these guys just trying to keep pushing the risk off of their books. I think it's a, it's a lot of everything. I think what you said was it a low interest rate environment that made these securities more marketable. That's part of it. But the securitization process by itself is a good process. It does distribute risk out over many, uh, of, of, uh, amongst different countries. About it, and that makes it better for society as a whole. It makes it easier for Joe to get a mortgage in Toledo than it does uh, if there wasn't securitization. If there wasn't securitization, then Joe would have to go to his Toledo branch, his Toledo branch would hold that, that mortgage and that savings and loan institution wouldn't, be, wouldn't, be, wouldn't have the geographic diversification that it could otherwise obtain. So there's lots of reasons why, why this is good. The primary reason, in my opinion, is the search for liquidity. So you're creating these bins, the illiquid bins, you're pooling together with other illiquid bins, and then you're tranching out the top quarter bud. So if you've got 100 million in illiquid securities, you can create a tra tranche, maybe of 500 million, that's going to be quite secure, because it's got the backing of the whole big bin. And then it's just the bottom bin of the bin that's not, 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 not uh, liquid. Are you saying that basically if you start, if that CDO2 starts out with all the, with only illiquid assets from CDO, yeah. how do you get some of them to be? Okay, so, so imagine each, there's ten, there's 10 of these, these 10 of these okay. that participate, each with $10 million. So you've got $100 million here. And you've got conceptually interest from $100 million coming in. And you say to the top tranche, you'll get all of that, and the top tranche is this 80 million. You'll get all the interest. And then if there's anything left over, we'll go to the, we'll give it down to the stinky stuff. So only some of those would be performing. Yeah. They're still lousy, but it's a probability deal. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's lousy loan by loan, right. but the security is quite secure. Because it is AAA. Because, I mean, of, because of the probability loan, because of the math. Because of the math. Yeah. But it is, it is absolutely secure. Uh, you know, the agencies correctly rated it a AAA based on the assumptions they made. <laughs> <laughs> and the assumptions they made, I mean, this is why you talk, if we could talk about the Act Swan effects, there's a lot of things going on. But it, it's sort of a little bit like, you know, the turkey the day before Thanksgiving saying, yeah, I think life's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, as long as you look historically at what's happened, this, these things are pretty secure. But Maybe also to give an example, I mean, if you picture, you know, banks here in the U.S., we have some banks, say, in Texas, other banks in Florida, some banks here in Ohio. So one of the things they did was, uh, the banks in Texas, you know, they may securitize, you know, the Texas uh, mortgages, the banks here, they're securitizing the Ohio mortgages. So they thought, hey, if, you know, there are a lot of foreclosures in Texas, if you simply pull them with mortgages from Ohio and from Florida and from Mississippi, um, probably things will be good in Ohio, Mississippi, and Florida. What they hadn't expected was that all of these markets right now are actually moving together. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's a good point. Is there a computer doing that kind of model? How far you can do this? I mean, this could be affinity. Yeah, you could do a CDO queue. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm saying affinity. I mean, you could do it how many times? I mean, uh, like taking olive and olive oil. Correct. Yeah, you can concentrate olive oil and then sell it off again and concentrate that off and sell it off you again. Got extra virgin, virgin, and then you got. It's not good then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the junk is never bought. And so that's why you securitize junk with other junk and create something uh, marketable out of junk. So if it all works well. <laughs> as long as home prices keep going up. But it's not, if you think that's bad, <laughs> I've got news for you. Uh, so here's the CDO market. Uh, you can see it, it's, it's been expanding quite uh, dramatically up until uh, 2007, 2006, 2007. A good fraction of this came from what's called arbitrage CDOs. 
Okay, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about these arbitrage CDOs and something related to that, which is called synthetic CDOs. Peter, can I add one more comment? Can you go back to two slides? Certainly. Like one of the reasons why in the news you hear uh, quite a lot about CDOs and also CDO squared is that you know, if you start with the, with the original securitization, so you have you know, the AAA tranche, which is, which is great, you have AA tranches, and it goes down, and let's say maybe the B tranche, which, is, which, is, which has a bit ra rather low rating, if you have several B tranches that are pulled and become a CDO, so that the highest tranches are now again rated AAA, then AA, et cetera, Indeed, it works in a market that goes up. If the market goes down, like it is doing uh, these days, the double B tranche in the original structure um, is hit by a lot of defaults. So a lot of these investors are not getting are not getting paid. So if you then pull these double B tranches, even the triple A tranche in the CDO will not be paid in full. So all of these investors that bought the AAA tranches in the CDO, a lot of them are not being paid, and it only gets worse with the CDO squared. There's nothing left for the AAA tranche in the CDO squared, let alone everybody we know. We just want to introduce Krista. Hi, that's Krista Baumann. She's a member of our finance faculty, and um, you're going to hear a lot from her, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, let's talk about the synthetic CDOs and, um, and the derivative markets. You know, I, it's been my experience that whenever you hear about complexity, when something goes wrong, people say, I knew all that complex stuff was a load of garbage and it's all bad. And that's pretty dangerous because the securitization, I tell you, if the securitization market does not come back, our society is definitely worse off for it. Securitization is definitely a good thing. And you just make one bad, bad mistake. And it's been a costly mistake. But over the years, it's, been, it's worked out very well. And so there are a lot of good things. And that's the same thing is true about derivatives. Derivative markets are not bad markets. There's no such thing as a bad derivative. You know, there's no such thing, I, I guess, there's no such thing as a bad gun. It's just bad people. <laughs> and there's, you know, people have used derivatives perhaps badly. Derivatives are leveraged bets or can be used as leveraged bets. So you see that from the New York Times, they report that the, the, uh, the notional amount of derivatives in 2002 was $101 trillion. I mean, you can wallpaper the earth several times over with $1 bills, maybe $100 bills, with, with $101 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's $100,000 billion. That's more. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. In 2008 dollars a time, it was $531 trillion. And most of this is the interest rate swap market, which is, you know, it's a good market. And, but the credit default swap market has just grown enormously in the last five years. To almost a $60 trillion market, it's probably down now to uh, a $30 trillion market. So, you know, the wise man in 2006 said the credit default swap is probably the most important instrument in finance. That's a pretty uh, heavy duty statement coming from Alan Greenspan. And what he said is what credit default swaps did is lay off all the risk of highly leveraged institutions, and that's what banks are, highly leveraged on stable American and, inter and international institutions. It allows you to spread the risk around, and that ultimately is a good thing. So just very briefly, and I know my time is rapidly running out, and, uh, but, but let me just proceed to illustrate how these work and how they relate to the credit crisis. So here we have KeyBank that's a little concerned that General Motors is going to default. Well, this was four years ago. <laughs> and so they go to a contract with uh, AIG. 
AIG actually is one of my, if, you know, I'm angry about one company in all of this, it's actually AIG. I, you know, I, I'm, yeah, don't get me going on AIG. Yeah. <laughs> they should have known better. So we, what we're going to do, KeyBank is going to pay, the swap rate is 10%, the notional is 100 million, which means KeyBank is going to pay AIG $10 million a year. So what do they get for that $10 million? They get an insurance contract. And if, and if General Motors defaults, AIG will, rate, will, will, get, will give him some money. How much money? It will depend on what the bonds of, of General Motors trade at. So say the bonds of General Motors are trading at $0.02 cents on the dollar, then they'll get $0.98 cents back. The payment here would be $98 million. Okay, so it's just a straight insurance contract based on the life or death of general mergers. That's how this, this market works. It's an unregulated insurance contract. It's a completely unre unregulated market, this. So here you have a company called Primus, and it bet uh, on Lehman Bro Bro Brothers. Uh, it was a seller of protection, that's what this means, seller of protection of $80 million, and it, there were many buyers of protection. And the recovery rate turned out to be 8.625 cents on the dollar. That meant when Lehman defaulted, uh, Primus had to pay 91.375 cents on the dollar. And that turned out to be $73 million. Okay. Now Primus is pretty good at this. It wrote $80 million on Lehman. It wrote $250 million on Fannie and Freddie. It great 16 million on WAMU and 68 million on some bank in Iceland. <laughs> so they really knew what they were doing. And uh, they turned around and they said, don't worry about it, we've got 820 million in cash to meet our obligations. But certainly, if you are going to be in the business of selling protection, you better have reserve cash on hand to be able to meet your obligations. And in an unregulated market, that's a bit of a problem. If this was a regulated market, they'd be mandated through a clearinghouse to have a certain set of funds uh, aside, depending on their position. Now, right now, there's over $1 trillion in bets on the success or failure of general mergers. These contracts have been written maybe four or five years ago. And they were written at very cheap rates. And now, if you were a buyer of protection, you say, yeah, I'm looking good. Chances are you're going to make a lot of money. And when you look at $1 trillion in swaps, I mean, the entire capitalization of General Motors is about $5 billion. Yeah, you have to take that one off. It's been a month. Yeah, I did. I said $5 billion. Now, these credit default spreads, so they're quoted in the marketplace. There are these interdealer brokers that scourge around and get this information, and they broadcast it. And this is called price discovery. It's very valuable because we see credit default swap rates. And the rates charged for insurance rising. We know that something's going wrong with that company. It's like an early warning signal. So it complements the equity price as a signal about the quality of the stock. In fact, right now in our marketplace, we see there's a little bit of a disconnect between what the equity markets are saying, what the debt markets are saying, and what the credit default swap markets are saying. Sometimes they say conflicting things. Okay, so banks that take on credit risk have the opportunity to lay this risk off for a price. This is a good thing. If I'm a key bank and I'm dealing with Eaton, uh, repeatedly, and I suddenly think Eaton's going to go bad, then I've got two choices. I can say I'm not going to lend you any more money, or I can say I'm going to lend you money, and then I've got a loan which I don't want, it's too big for my position, so what I will do is buy credit insurance on Eaton and keep that loan. Okay, then if Eaton does go badly up, at least I'll get reimbursed some money. So, of course, this means, this has the exact same problems that securitization has. It leads to two problems. The first problem is adverse selection. 
And the second problem is moral hazard. It means that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that Key Bank has an incentive to keep their best loans and then write insurance or sell their bad loans. And there is a market for selling of loans, just like there's a market for selling of mortgages. And it leads to moral hazard. Why don't we lend the money to, to Eaton? Because even though we think they're going down the tubes, no one hears from Eaton. Sure. Uh, <laughs> we think Eaton is going down the tubes. We can still, uh, we still won't lose money because we'll buy credit protection. In fact, one of my colleagues uh, here, uh, Anurag Gupta, you may have noticed that he's been written up in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there's been a few articles about some of the research that he's been doing, which has shown uh, that these adverse selection and moral hazard issues in the loan market are very severe. So here's, the, here's how it ties in very nicely with the CEOs. If you have a risky bond, an Eaton bond, an Eaton loan, and you buy credit protection on it, you basically have a riskless bond, right? right? But here's the other thing. I can create an Eaton bond. I can create a risky bond by buying government bonds and selling a credit default swap. I don't even have to be involved in Eaton, but I can get Eaton risk. I'll say that again. I don't have anything to do with Eaton, but I can hold Eaton risk. So this is what investment banks do. You know, investment banks are pretty smart. Instead of creating a CDO the old-fashioned way, what they would do is buy a lot of treasuries. These are very easy to buy. So they'd go out and buy a whole bunch of treasuries, and then they'd sell a credit default swap on Eaton, They'd sell a credit default swap on some second name, third name, fourth name, 125th name. And they put this in a pool. Now they have the exact same exposure as a portfolio of loans on those 125 names, even though they don't own any of those 125 names. Now we don't have to do this on individual firms. We could do this on tranches. We could do this on anything. So we could create risk of mortgage-backed securities without even owning mortgage-backed securities. So what we're doing now is we're gambling, we gambling on the direction of mortgage-backed securities without having any real skin in the game. And that, I don't know if that's a problem or not, but that's a reality. And this market just went, went crazy, synthetic CDOs. It's a lot easier to do this and worry about all the details of a mortgage-backed security. What, what's the redeeming value of that, the economic growth or anything else? Or is that just the banks trying to make some money with new ways of telling? Yeah, so they're trying to arbitrage between, they create a synthetic CDO, and then over here there's an actual CDO, and there's price differentials between them, and they're trying to arbitrage those two markets. So in an efficient market, their activity should be appreciated by us all because their activity will make will bring these markets in together and will result in the price of these um, credit default swaps being fair and being informative about information content on the underlying securities. But so just a lot of large number. More people. More people address. scrutinizing these things, bringing more attention to ultimately to the individual firms, reflecting more complete information. So theoretically, that's what an academic would say. A cynical Wall Streeter may say, no, we just want to rip these consumers off because uh, there's differences in prices here and we can create this a lot more cheaper than we can create this. There's not much difference between a person on Wall Street and a person building a house. A person building a house can use good quality material or get by with bad material. I mean, ulti ultimately, there's ethics involved there's incentive contracts, compensation contracts, which I'm sure some of our faculty will talk about later on, and how, how to incentivize people to do the right thing. I'll skip a lot of this. Um, how do you think we use the time? Can I go another 10 minutes? Sure. Yeah. Is this okay? Is this, is this, are you getting something out of this? 
you can dig my desk. So, okay, so I've set the stage. I've set the stage, and now I want to just highlight a few key things that I think happened that I think were very, uh, very interesting. And the first thing is uh, what City did. This was uh, the first problem, the first, I call it a private data. <coughs> But how we had this, you know, this, you know, the, sort of this, this pseudo savings and loan set up by city, and it has assets on its balance sheet, and it has a bunch of liabilities. Okay, so these assets were doing badly, really badly, and so um, city group decided they had to do something about it, and so. Um, they thought they'd better start selling these things. Well, if they started selling them and there'd be a fire sale, then all asset-backed security prices in the market would drop. And that would affect Bank of America because they had a mark their books to market. That would affect uh, how they did that at Bank of America, at JP Morgan, and at Citi on their own books. So these Bank of America actually didn't have any of these SIRs. I'm not sure, if, I don't think JP Morgan had any of these SIRs. But these three entities got together and tried to crop up the prices of So it's an attempt to sort of go against what the real prices were to some extent. And again, they did this because they, were, they didn't want to mark down their bonds, their asset-backed securities on their own book. So instead of calling it a bailout, they called it a master liquidity enhancement conduit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You just mentioned the, the market market. There seems to be a lot of debate out there whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. What is your opinion on that? How they yeah. It seems that marking to market is pro cyclical, right? So that uh, if good things happen, it strengthens the balance sheet up and, and, and enables uh, uh, investors to take on even more risk. And in bad times, marking to market leads to fire sales, which further put pressure, downward pressure on, on prices. And that's a bad thing. Uh, having said that, you know, I don't know what the alternative is. Um, you know, so, a true, do you think it gives a true value of the underlying securities? Well, I don't know what the true value is. The true value, I guess, is ultimately the selling price. So if there is a fire sale, I mean, who's to say that that's not the fair price, right? I mean, it goes back to my earlier comment when the ducks are quacking feed them. I mean, actually, in financial markets, all financial securities, all the time, should be zero net present value projects. It's very difficult to create value through trading, right? And so, you know, I said facetiously when the ducks are quacking feed them, that means somehow some investment banks are extracting some rent from, 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 from these uh, securities. So overall, I, I, I guess I'm not an expert in this area, so I don't really, I don't claim to have an intelligent answer for you. I see some of the problems with marking to market. But I don't know what the alternative is, so I come down in favor, roughly in favor of marking to market. Maybe in very stressful times, like we are now, maybe there should be some other alternative. But I'm, I'm not an expert to give any guidance on what that other alternative should be. Lower of cost or market, wouldn't that be all the way of pricing? Huh. Yeah, that, that, that would be the same. That's true for industrial firms, but. Um, Imagine if uh, we changed all of your brokerage accounts that even during good times your broker's statement was lower cost per market. And we'd rather probably have higher cost per market today. It's a joke. But um, uh, you know, how does that help? I mean, the, you know, again, we're not accountants, we're, we're finance folks, but the notion of market to market is so there's transparency so investors can see through the value of the firms. Lower cost per market would, would hide that. Didn't the Europeans go to that a modified deal where long-term assets they could go ahead and and not mark the market but assume some kind of default wave and then that price of value? Didn't the Europeans sure. do that? I think the move to mark to market is a relatively new move. I think it's a positive move overall, but there are some negative, there are some drawbacks. 
Well, that bailout plan didn't really work, and eventually City did come and rescue its subs and put them back on their balance sheet. Well, I guess Lehman declares bankruptcy. That was ultimately uh, a bit of a, a bit of a bomb. I mean, this really. We could go back in time and undo one thing, maybe we'd undo that Lehman going, uh, going bankrupt. They weren't bailed out. Uh, the three largest remaining investment banks uh, sell themselves or, or became a depository institutions. Uh, a big, big problem by not bailing out Lehman. And then AIG nearly collapsed. And why I'm so angry with AIG is because they're an insurance company. And insurance companies, as some of you have mentioned, you know, it's all based on the law of large numbers. If I have a car accident, that doesn't mean you're more likely to have a car accident or not. Car accidents are independent of each other, roughly speaking. So by pooling them, you get more predictability. What AIG did, at least in my opinion, is they sold a lot of credit protection. And they thought they had a big basket and they treated it as if they were all independent. That's what I think Krista was saying as well. They treated these events as if they were all independent. But they're not independent. The law of large numbers doesn't hold. Because if one home price goes bad, a lot of home prices go bad. They all work together. Credit risk is systemic, endemic in our economy. And so they're all highly correlated. And they didn't understand this. They were dealing with products that they didn't understand at a finance 101 <coughs> level. It had nothing to do with getting super high priced uh, uh, mathematicians to come and work out the second decimal place of the pricing of these things. That's all irrelevant. It's basic risk management 101. And so I'm angry. I'm angry. Well, they didn't have the cash reserves to back them up. Yet. They just didn't have the cash reserves to back it up. That's exactly right. They thought it was an insurance product, so they looked at the average exposure. But since these markets move in tandem, they needed to look at the entire distribution, worst case scenario, and have enough capital to take into account worst case scenarios. <coughs> so they ignored correlation risk completely. Well, why was Lehman the big... The, the big uh, problem here, why, you know, in hindsight, we should have saved Lehman. Why? Because, in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, they, the Fed went in and looked at Lehman and looked at all their complicated derivative products and said, oh, we may be able to let this one go. And based on that assessment, they were right. But they forgot about very simple products, like commercial paper, short-term financing. And what happened when, 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 uh, um, when, when Lehman went under, Reserve primary fund, a money fund, who had bought their commercial paper, had bought Lehman debt, uh, they, they uh, ran into problems. So once you have a money fund running into problems, and money funds had grown ma massively over this time period, there was a run on these money funds. <coughs> and that was a real problem. And in fact, one of the largest reserve primary funds, uh, they, they, they actually uh, defaulted. I think I'll skip this uh, money funds. I'm just maybe in the interest of time, I'll talk about what happened. Uh, the credit default swaps contracts can be written on anything. And so what you see is credit default swaps written on governments, on sovereigns, including the United States. And so if you look at the United, uh, United States credit default swap rates, they, uh, they these green, this, this green curve here, and they're very low in 2007, but rising. So you can bet on the government defaulting. And they actually shot up to about 35 basis points. Remember earlier on, I was saying these mortgage-backed securities had a spread of about 50 basis points? Here yeah, during our crisis, we've got credit default swap rates, which are 50 basis points of the same magnitude on our own government. So, roughly speaking, this run on, 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 on the money funds uh, caused this commercial paper market to dry up. 
And that caused problems for General Electric, Caterpillar, all these firms, but all of a sudden they didn't have financing. They couldn't get financing to, to pay their employees. So that's the key link. That's the key link. The role of money funds have become increasingly more important. And there's a whole story we could go into on that, but I, I guess in the interest of time, I will, I will skip it up. I'll end up with, two, with, with a couple of things. Maybe I'll skip those. I'll end up by talking a little bit about what happened with the Federal Reserve. You know, their mission is uh, twofold, uh, to keep liquidity at levels consistent with stable prices and to provide liquidity to keep the banking system afloat. Those are their two missions. And so what they did is they poured hundreds of billions of dollars into the system to try and lower the Fed funds rate which had skyrocketed once, this, once banks started hoarding cash for many reasons. Um, excess reserves soared at these banks. Uh, typically, excess reserves are two billion. They're now about 190 billion. Banks are scared to lend money. Uh, here at Case, we, you know, we need operations to go on on a pretty much daily basis. And so we have a line of credit with one of the banks downtown, and we just wanted to see if, whether that line of credit that revolved or was alive. And so we tested it out. And I'm sure there were many, many firms testing out whether their lines of credit would hold during this financial crisis. Banks anticipating that needed to hoard more cash. So what did the uh, banks do? What, what did the Fed do? Well, the first thing they had to do is stop this run on money funds. They had no choice in this. This layman default, they, they missed this, that this could happen. So what they did is they guaranteed the money market funds for the short term. Well, the second thing they had to do was uh, stop the abnormal speculation on financial stocks by hedge funds. So they imposed short sales restrictions. I'm not sure if that worked or not. It was later revoked. They stopped the migration of hedge fund money out of surviving investment <coughs> banks. Hedge fund money was just being pulled out of these investment banks. And so what did they do to stop that? They converted the surviving ones into, into banks. And then they uh, got to get support on housing prices. So how do you get support on housing prices? Well, they proposed the first bailout plan, which you'll hear more about uh, in a couple of minutes. And they don't want the government to do all the work. And so they try and encourage private equity to take up some of the slack. And so they allow them to have up to a 33% stake in banks. And then a little later on, they realized, well, we're guaranteeing money market funds. We're not guaranteeing regular deposit accounts. And individual <coughs> consumers are starting to pull their money out of banks. And so they increased deposit insurance to $250,000. I'll skip Fannie and Freddie. And I'll end up just making a few comments that what we're going through now is a deleveraging cycle. And uh, we also are looking at the changing nature of investment banking. So let's see what works with investment banking and what doesn't work. I know. Give me two more minutes. Is that okay? So what works with investment banking, that's what happens. You get a professor on stage and you know there's sort of claw marks all the way back to <laughs> Uh, with investment banking, um, what, what's worked, what works is things like advisory work and mergers and acquisitions. Underwriting seems to be working. Private banking and wealth management uh, seems to be working. Investment management sort of working. Um, what's probably not working is structured products and derivatives where you need the high leverage. Trading activities not working very well. Prime brokerage not working very well. All these aspects probably are un un have to undergo major changes. Uh, probably uh, during the next sessions we can talk about the impact in global markets. Uh, maybe this is a good time to, to, to stop.
Okay, Peter, thank you.